Uh, my name is Maureen Katchman. I am the director of the Metabolomics Corps, um, along with Chuck Burant and Dr. Penether. Um, so I'm the managing director. I am sort of in charge of, you know, making sure the staff have all the resources they need to uh, produce excellent metabolomics data for you. Um, and the other part of my role is really up front and at the end. Um, so, for example, um, you know, when you're coming to the metabolomics core, you might want to consult with one of us before you send samples in, as you've heard over and over again in the initial talks here. Um, so definitely feel free to contact me um, to start talking about your project, you know, what recommendations we have for uh, getting going, what kinds of um, sample considerations you have. And then really at the end as well, um, once you get your data, if you have questions, you're welcome to ask the individual analyst who did that for you. Um, we do have, uh, you know, those people are in contact with the uh, customers all the time, sending reports. But if you have questions beyond sort of what can be answered in that short conversation, feel free to contact me again about coming in and literally having a meeting, a uh, consultation to talk about the data and what the next steps are in particular. Okay, where do we go from here? We have our data now. What's, uh, what's next after that? Okay, so the objectives for today's session are really to understand the role of study design in gathering metabolomics data, to understand how to procure services from the metabolomics core, so how do you get started with us, um, to understand what our standard offerings are. Uh, we talked about a lot of different kinds of experiments today, fluxomics, untargeted, et cetera, so I want to kind of go through and define those a little bit more, um, maybe not necessarily to the level of detail that um, some of the later speakers are going to do, but I want to at least define those a little bit more. And then for you to understand the role of data interpretation in some of the untargeted studies. So kind of be broken up in two places, sort of targeted and untargeted. Ah, it's working, good. Okay, so um, a little bit more about study design for metabolomics. Anna and Kelly and um, Chuck talked uh, quite a bit about the pre-analysis considerations you know, everything from consistency, <laughs> making sure that you, you know, feed your mice the same diet and you don't have two different groups eating different things. Um, they also talked a little bit about the last sort of minute um, uh, sort of considerations, you know, after you've gotten your animals to where you want them to be and you're about to go ahead and uh, get tissue samples, making sure that you um, quench those samples putting them in liquid nitrogen, for example, um, as soon as possible and getting them into the minus 80 freezer. Um, they did not talk as much about the use of biological replicates um, as we will talk about later. Um, and I'm sure you have a lot of questions about that. The more samples you have, as Chuck pointed out, uh, the better your statistics will be. But I wanted to put in a little plug here from the point of view as the, um, of myself as the laboratory manager. Um, even if you're doing a pilot study, it's probably a good idea to have some biological replicates in that study. And, it's, you know, I, we recommend usually three at a minimum and more if possible. And part of the reason for that is that you want to have really clear data coming out of your pilot study if you can, um, because you're probably going to base a much bigger study on that. And you're going to put a lot of money into that bigger study in just your sample prep part of it before you even get to the metabolomics part of it or whatever other omics you're going to do. So it's really important to get a pretty clear idea of what's going on um, from your pilot study. Um, case in point, we did have um, some investigators who had sort of some uh, information that came out of their pilot study, which was a little confusing to them. And they went ahead with their full study anyway and this is sort of before I came to the Corps. <laughs> if I had, had been here, I think I would have recommended that they follow up the pilot study with another smaller pilot study just to make sure that they knew what was going on. Um, this is a fluxomics experiment, and as we'll talk about a little bit later in fluxomics, um, the conditions in which you grow your cells are very, very important. So, um, so just make sure that you, know, you have enough replicates in your pilot study that you get a clear idea of what's going on. Um, and then, Collection and control of metadata, um, I think this was touched on a little bit in the earlier, um, you know, earlier talks. I mean, it was talked about how you need to control it. It wasn't necessarily talked about collecting it other than, you know, it's important to know what's going on. Um, 
documenting everything you know about these samples and, and making sure that we have that information. And part of the reason I'm putting it in here is because, um, you know, if we have that information, you know, we can start to, like, play with statistics and when you're getting your um, data back and get you a little bit more information about what's going on, um, you know, bef before you get, when you get the final report, so. Um, we're all trying to stick with the workflow so that everybody can have sort of a guidepost of where, um, where they are in the sample process. And, you know, I think here we're still at the point of, you know, talking about the initial consultations and, um, and getting your samples to us. So that's where we are in the process. Okay, so I wanted to do a little kind of case study talk about hypothesis-driven metabolomics. So this is what we might call targeted metabolomics. In other words, uh, you know, you have a hypothesis and you know sort of what, um, what you're looking for. So you're going to want to go through and say, can we find these metabolites? Can the core do this for us? And so um, I'm just going to highlight this study from El Zatari and uh, colleagues here at the University of Michigan. I believe Dr. Kamada um, was the one who actually brought the samples to us. Um, and so this group had a hypothesis that uh, um, that tryptophan catabolism to kynorinin was important in C. difficile uh, infection. So um, that was based on previous studies that they had done. And so basically they designed an experiment to try to test this. And they um, went ahead and got knocked down mice for IDO1 because that's the enzyme that catabolizes tryptophan to kynorinin. Um, and then, as far as the rest of the experimental design goes, um, I think up at the top they, they make you know, a point about what they did with these mice. They um, went ahead and fed them some antibiotics to kind of prime the system for the infection, uh, kept them on just a water diet for a couple of days, and then infected them with the C. difficile. So over here is really just kind of the result of the metabolomics data, and they were looking for something quite simple. They want to know the kynorinin levels. So we have the wild-type mice here with and without infection. I'm sorry, without and with. <laughs> and then the knockdown mice without and with the infection. So after we um, measured the, and this data was collected here at the core, after we measured the kynorinin levels, there was a clear difference between sort of without infection and the wild-type mice with the infection versus the knockdown mice with and without, which was to be expected because, um, you know, they knocked down that enzyme, so they weren't expecting much in the way of kynorinin levels. But the important part of this study is that what they then found, too, was that in the wild-type mice, there was a much less severe presentation of the disease. So um, what I forgot to say earlier was that uh, they measured this in the cecum of the animals, so they harvested the cecum and brought us the tissue from the cecum, and that's how we measured the kynorinin. And um, in the IDO1 knockdown mice, the presentation of the CDFCL was much more severe. They had mucosal damage and, um, and hemorrhaging in the cecum. So that was now establishing a link between kynorinin levels and a less severe um, outcome of the, disease, of the infection. And so, you know, that at that point established for them the link between kynorinin levels and the outcome, but they didn't have a mechanism yet. So the rest of the paper goes on to talk about um, how, you know, how they elucid elucidated the mechanism, but I just want to make the point that the metabolomics was really the first step in this study, um, and it was also an important step to, you know, make the link between what, you know, what they, what they thought was happening and the mechanism that they could come up with for that. So I'm going to go forward. So this is what, you know, a classic case of targeted metabolomics. You know what you're looking for, and you want to come to the core and figure out if we can help you find it. <laughs> so this may sound familiar to some of you. Um, some of you are, are really probably interested in doing targeted metabolomics, and I don't want it to be uh, just the stepdaughter of the untargeted platform and that kind of thing. It's a very important platform. It's uh, really probably 
more than half of our business at this time. Um, but it's also important for follow-up studies if you do an untargeted study, you know, and you want to go back and, and see uh, more depth or more detail about what, you know, what is really going on in that pathway. And it's, it's so, okay. So I'm going to go ahead and go familiar. Go on. So if uh, you start thinking about doing targeted metabolomics, um, you know, you may, now that you're here <laughs> at this workshop, you're probably going to contact one of us and just try to kind of come in and talk to us because consultation is always really important. But you may have come across our website at some point. Um, and I just wanted to point out a few things about our website. Um, over here uh, and here are some of those documents that uh, Kelly was referring to, sample collection guidelines and um, sample preparation guidelines. And then in addition to that, um, you know, there's a lot of other forms here that you could maybe start getting filled out if you're, you know, like I said, interested in procuring metabolomic services. And um, I, I mentioned this because this is really a lot, a lot of people want to go through and see what there is to see before they contact us. They want to say, hey, well, I want more information, just like we all do probably when we, you know, start looking for a new car. We're going to, of course, go and check out what's there before we go to the dealership. So additionally, as you go down that, um, that, page, you'll, you know, you'll have a list of all the assays that we offer here, the standard assays that we offer right now, and this is a, actually kind of a smaller list than what we really have. Chuck actually had a much bigger list on his slide, and I say that because this is what we have prices for, and at, at, we only set our prices once a year, so there's a lot of other metabolites we're starting to look for, and what we normally do is, is kind of align that with another assay that we already do. So please contact us if you don't see something here that you're interested in, because we have many, many other assays that aren't up there yet. So again, if you want to start looking at NS, you're like, okay, well, that's great. You have a you know, bioassays assay, but what does it cover? So the next part is just to sort of um, get this introductory information sheet, which really should be a link on the website, and it will be shortly. But at the moment, just email me, and I'll send you something like this. And it really tells you, this is only one of two pages for this essay. Um, it really tells you exactly what the, uh, you know, the metabolites that are measured in that assay are, as well as um, some more information about like, how much material we need to do that essay and that sort of thing, and the limit of detection. So I talked about this being a targeted assay. And so I just wanted to go back and just kind of define what a targeted assay is in, our ter in terms of our um, understanding. So starting a targeted assays, really what they do is they either map as much of a particular pathway as possible or a class of compound. So either we're looking at the glycolysis and TCA pathways or we're looking at bile acids or, or acylcarnitines. Um, sometimes we need to use multiple methods to get all the crucial compounds in a particular pathway. And I, I mention this because um, just that, that data is usually combined in a final report for you, but um, just keep in mind that there's usually not one mass spec method or separation method that can get every compound that you are interested in. So many of our platforms will use multiple methods. Um, they generally provide absolute quantitation. So what is meant by that is Literally, I think even Chuck alluded to it, um, we literally run a calibration curve of, of, of authentic standards for the compounds you're interested in. And then, you know, wherever your, wherever your sample falls on the calibration curve, we report back that amount. There's a lot more that goes into it before that. And I have another um, talk tomorrow about how we do data analysis for targeted metabolomics. But I just wanted to, to let you know that this is a little bit different from untargeted because untargeted is more relative quantitation, um, you know, the difference between, between two samples, and this is absolute. And then data normalization, again, um, some of the other speakers alluded to it, but we have set ways we sort of normalize the data um, based on what it is, whether it's plasma or tissue or fecal material. Um, and those are, you know, normally if it's cells, we'll do a protein determination, for example. Um, if it's tissue, we'll do uh, wet weight. If it's fecal material, we'll do dry weight, likely. Um, nothing about fecal material, very important that you kind of make sure that you 
we need more usually of that for humans than we do of other sample types because we want to make sure that we're getting a homogeneous part of the material to do metabolomics on. So in other words, it's comparable from one sample to the next. Um, we want to make sure that we're not, you know, getting a bunch of undigested material in one sample and fully digested material in the other one. And that actually can be true for tissues as well. We're going to, on our end at the core, we're going to look at the tissue and make sure that we're, you know, getting as homogeneous an area before we extract it for you that, as we can and make sure we're not, you know, getting a lot of connective tissue in there if that's, if it's muscle or whatever the case. So data normalization is important, but we also do some other things up front to make sure that, you know, we're getting the most homogeneous sample we can from, from what you send us. So keep that in mind. So, that, so when we ask for a little bit more tissue or more, um, you know, uh, fecal material than you might think we need, that's why, because we're making sure that we're really careful about the sections that we take. Um, so now I've told you a little bit about our standard targeted assays as we have them now, and I want to talk about what if, you know, you come and you look at our website and there's no assay that covers what you're interested in? How do we do method development? Um, so briefly, uh, method development is probably what you would do in your lab if you're developing other biological methods. First thing you're probably going to do is a literature search. Um, nobody wants to recreate the wheel. So if there's a method out there, we may be able to um, modify it or use it. Um, you may also do that. You may be looking through a paper and say, hey, I found this paper and this is what they did. And you bring the paper to us and you say, can you reproduce it? Um, so of course, the things that go into being able to reproduce paper are instrumentation. So we may or may not have the same instrumentation that was used in that paper. But, um, but we can probably modify it to go with what we have. Um, but, you know, the usual things too, you know, how many steps are involved and just being, you know, being careful that we know that everything is done in the most efficient way and that the paper was done um, the way that we would have done it. <laughs> um, we're going to be looking at what separation method we're going to be use, using. And um, Charles is going to talk a lot more about what is all this LCGC stuff and, and, and mass spectrometry, which about half the audience feel like they know, have a good handle on the other half, maybe not so much. So, so he will talk about it. He's very entertaining. So even if you know a lot about it, you'll be entertained by that. Um, but we will be looking at the method that's most suitable for developing um, these, a method for your compounds. The next thing we're going to do is uh, try to purchase authentic standards or internal standards. So the authentic standards would be used to sort of develop the method so that we don't have to have 10,000 samples before we get it right and get it optimized, right? <laughs> That's the first reason we want to have authentic, you know, authentic standards. Um, and the internal standards, as others have alluded to, especially Chuck, those will come in either at the point of method development or uh, at the point when we're just finally starting to run the samples as a way to normalize the data. Again, not not just including, you know, sort of looking at protein determination or cell counts or things like that, but to normalize it from within the system. And again, I'll talk a little bit more about that when I talk about targeted data analysis, because there's a very specific way that we add internal standards so that we get the best result out for you um, in terms of normalization. Um, we'll be looking at the mass spec method, whether we are using sort of a, um, you know, a, a one that's very specific to the mass, of the compound we're looking for or one that's more specific to the mass and being able to fragment it and things like that. Um, so once we've, the first three steps can kind of all be done on the standards. And then the next step is going to be done on the actual samples. Um, you can give us just samples that aren't really important controls or whatever that we can play with. And we'll make sure that we are getting the right um, homogenization method down for your samples, and as well, uh, look at different extraction buffers, what's the best. We have a lot of experience with different extraction buffers, so as you can see, or as you may have seen, we have, you know, already 20, 30 targeted assays, and so we kind of know, we've tried a lot of different extraction buffers, and we know which buffers kind of extract which metabolites, um, you know, based on their chemical properties. Um, we will also be looking at the metabolite stability, so 
there are a few types of metabolites that we need to be wary of if we're trying to um, extract them, and that's like oxidized thiols, for example. You know, we have to really be careful with those and probably analyze them the same day the samples um, is uh, brought to us. And then last thing is, all of that development is great, um, but we need to look at, do a literature search for the metabolites of interest and kind of look at, you know, is there any information anywhere that tells us what we can expect from your, from your samples, if they're normal people, not people with uh, necessarily a disease state. And may, many of you may have heard of the Human Metabolome Database, which is just called HMDB for short. So we'll go ahead and look at that as well and make sure that, um, that we know uh, how much material might be in your samples. And I'll actually show a screenshot of that in a minute. So. Um, so this is just a brief kind of idea of how we did method development for um, a particular pathway that we've been asked to develop recently. Um, mavalinate pathway, uh, there were 11 compounds and then two others that we were asked to, um, to see if we could detect all of this in one assay so we didn't have to sort of break it up amongst different assays. And again, going back to the idea of having these standards that we um, have, we're going to look at our instrumentation and see what is the optimal way to detect each of these compounds. And, um, you know, interestingly, these compounds all can come out in different forms um, or come, get into the mass spectrometer, spectrometer in different forms. So uh, we don't just assume that we know what's going on. We'll, we'll test it and see which is the one that's going to produce the best sensitivity for your compound because... Um, Obviously, the more sensitive it is when we're doing this on the standards, the more sensitive it will be for your, when it's in your, uh, your actual samples. And so um, this is just the second half of that group. And we were able to, again, find all these compounds and, um, and look at different forms of them and decide which was the, the best form. So the next thing we did after just kind of looking at all the standards was to go ahead to the human metabolome database. I know, is anybody familiar with this? Is this a tool that other people have used? Um, I don't know if I don't, I don't bore everybody if everybody knows about it. It's, it's just, it has a wealth of information about different metabolites. Um, and, you know, it'll be everything from, you know, molecular formula and, um, you know, information about the pathway, as well as um, some of the chemical properties, PK and things like that. But probably the more interesting thing to me is as you go down, it'll actually have sort of a um, survey of the literature of how, where this uh, compound has been seen and what tissues, et cetera, and normal amounts or diseased amounts. So they actually do break it out. And, and when they can, they'll break it out by, uh, this is a female-only study, male-only study, so we can get differences in the amounts there too. And I think um, the point of that is, um, just gives us an idea of what to expect in your samples. Um, and it also uh, is interesting because as we go further along with the science, what we're finding is that some of these numbers are getting lower as time goes on. Um, the newer studies are reporting lower levels of, of some of these compounds. And that, I think one of the reasons for that is partially like older instrumentation, you may not have been able to separate all the forms of a particular um, metabolite, and as we move on with uh, developments, we're being able to separate those, so we're getting a little bit more accurate quantitation. But I just wanted to show that as the next step would be sort of look at, see what we're expecting in your samples. So based on the previous HMDB search for, um, for the mevalinate uh, compounds, we decided that we'd try to port this method over from that original method, which looked really good on the standards, to another instrument. And I, I just wanted to make the point that and our first pass, it didn't look so great. <laughs> yeah, um, there is just a lot of optimization that goes into getting, um, getting one method that can detect all the compounds of interest. And um, so we're you know, still working on this to get it onto this instrument. Um, and I think I'm, I'm almost there with that particular pathway, getting nearly done. Um, there's a lot of things we can do from a point of view for, um, of a mass spectrometrist to sort of predict what's going to happen and sort of um, 
and sort of uh, be able to optimize that system. And this is just a, uh, a type of a database search where you can sort of say, okay, I know this is my compound. How do I expect it to fragment and sort of look at different ways of, of trying to detect fragment ions from a particular um, compound? So, okay, so the last thing is once we've got it on the proper instrument that we want it to be on and we've detected it at the level that we know that we're going to see from looking at your samples or looking in the Hummian meta Metabolome database and seeing um, that you know, we know what the expected levels are would be to create a standard curve. Um, I'm going to talk more about how we use a standard curve in you know, our um, data analysis for targeted data. But what I want to point out is that um, this standard curve may be very different for each of your compounds. You know, we expect um, you know, some compounds to be much higher in certain tissues and some to be much lower. So we're going to go ahead and try to um, optimize that for each compound in your sample or in your method. Okay, so that was kind of a brief overview of what we have, what we offer in terms of targeted metabolomics, and then a kind of a hopefully a brief overview to tell you um, how we're going to do method development if you, you know, come to us and say you want to see uh, particular compounds. Um, so I wanted to go on a little bit to the untargeted metabolomics, which you've been hearing a lot about. So um, just to kind of further define what that is, um, the difference between targeted and untargeted, as you may have picked up already on, is, you know, targeted, you're looking for a specific pathway. You're looking for um, usually a smaller number of molecules. And in untargeted, you're, you're really looking at everything, all the metabolites you can see in different samples, and those may be, um, you know, those samples are probably two different treatments or two different um, groups or, or multiple groups within there. So we're looking at comparing, you know, very, very large number of peaks that we're detecting in those samples. And um, as I think, you know, uh, individuals have been pointing out to this point, the experimental design is very important to make sure that um, the effect of whatever your treatment or whatever your differences are between um, your samples is strong enough to overcome any other variation in the samples. Um, our untargeted platform is multi-platform. We have both LCMS data and GCMS data, so you're going to get a wider range of compound classes that are available to you. Um, and one of the things that's unique about untargeted is that um, we have a compound library of about a thousand compounds that we have run on our instrumentation. And so when we detect all the peaks that are in your samples, you know, we'll identify quite a few of them against our library, but there'll be quite a few more that are not matching anything in our library. So it's important to know that one of the features of getting an untargeted metabolomics report back is that you're going to have a lot of unknown compounds. Um, now, there are many ways that we can go back and try to um, elucidate what those unknown compounds are. Again, I'm talking about that later. It's recursive analysis, um, how to take the results of an, an untargeted study and, and dig deeper into it. But I just want everybody to be you know, aware of that, that um, you know, when you're doing it untargeted, you're going to have a large number of unknown compounds that are reported back. Um, untargeted, again, is going to be uh, relative quantitation, so just differences between the two samples. Um, and oh, I already mentioned that, so we're going to have to do further analysis. And uh, the statistics about un um, untargeted metabolomics is going to be covered in great detail over the next few days of this talk. Um, and then, so we have targeted, untargeted, and untargeted also includes untargeted lipidomics, which has much the same result, except for there's more known compounds than there are unknowns, probably. Um, the last group of, of assays that we offer are flexomics, and again, I think Chuck has alluded a little bit to what this is. Charles and some of the other speakers are going to go in much greater detail, but... Um, 
you know, you're looking at the flux of, uh, say, some um, food source through through the cells of, of your um, your different um, your different cell lines or whatever this you're looking at. And so, what's important here is that you talk with somebody about your experimental design before you do it. Um, you know, the way you feed the cells is really important, as Chuck alluded to. Um, from the core's point of view, I also want to mention that when we, when you ask for a fluxomics experiment, um, you also kind of want to base that off of a targeted assay. So in other words, I want to do fluxomics, but I'm really interested in a glycolysis and TCA, so we're going to base that on um, a glyTCA type of analysis. The reason for that is that, um, you know, essentially uh, you need to know what's important for you to see and we need to extract the sample in the way that we'll be able to see what you're looking for. So if you say, I want to do fluxomics and it's based on a glycolysis TCA, we'll extract your sample one way. If you're saying, I want to do fluxomics, but I'm really interested in what's happening to the azelic carnitines, we're going to extract the sample a little differently. So if you need to see both of those, you're going to want to provide two sets of samples, one to be extracted each way. Um, you know, we have combined extraction methods at some point for different types of assays, but it, at any rate, it, you, you really want to talk to us about, you know, what's the best assay then once you've decided to do a flux study um, to kind of elucidate what you're looking for. Um, and sometimes that c we, can, we can add additional information to our standard assay. So we may um, say we're going to look for glycolysis and TCA, but oh, by the way, if we happen to see flux in all these different amino acids, we'll report that to you if we, if we can see it. So, um, but the extraction method up front is really important in the instrumental method. Um, so just a couple of housekeeping things. So if you're going to go ahead and submit samples to us, you're going to want to get started with the core. Um, First thing would be to have a consultation with one of us, probably. Um, I put myself and Chuck, and then I also put other lab members. Um, we're kind of a flat organization. Um, you will, uh, when you get data back, you may be talking with the analyst who did your data um, directly. And also, um, you know, some of the people who are running these platforms are experts in their particular area more so than I am. So uh, we definitely want you to feel free to contact experts in particular areas and come together with me and Chuck if you still have questions after that or we all work together to design your experiment. Um, you'll, want, you'll look at our website, hopefully, like I mentioned earlier. You may um, contact me to get the introductory information sheet about a particular assay and, and find out what we analyze. And then the last thing is, some of you are already familiar with the MyCore system, which is, uh, you know, the everything, all the biomedical research core facilities are using it now to go ahead and um, try to collect information from you about what kind of samples that you're sending and um, how to pay for them. <laughs> and so um, I just want to point out that uh, we have a staff member, Carrie Bonds, who is really instrumental in helping get everything into the MyCore system. Um, you know, she'll make sure you have all of your uh, forms that you need filled out um, to, to get into that system. And part of the reason why this is so important is because we put everything into our LIM system, our laboratory information management system, and um, that is kind of crucial <laughs> when you're an organization of our size. Um, we want to make sure that we know exactly, you know, your samples are logged into a place that's recorded. Um, and everybody is on the same page with regards to what assays you've asked for and which metabolites you're looking for um, because you don't really want to be working with the core that has, you know, one person who knows where those samples are and they're in the back of the freezer somewhere that, you know, we can't really find. So, so we, everything is, is, is done in a very systematic way. Um, samples are usually run in order by the date that we receive them. So... Um, that's just another thing I wanted to point out. Um, we do rush when we can. <laughs> There's a grant proposal coming up. Um, but usually, just to be fair to everybody, we try to do things in order. Um, some of the information that you'll need to know, that we'll need to know when you submit samples would be, um, you know, your sample name as it appears on the tube that you've written with permanent marker. 
not stuck a label on because those will fall off in the minus 80. Um, some information about your experimental design, including the factors. So actually, in our upload sheet, when we ask you what the samples are, we do ask you for whatever the factors are. You know, this is, these are wild type cells, these are knocked down, and two different treatments for all of them, so you have four groups. Um, this information is actually required for a couple of different reasons. Um, Chuck mentioned that we are, um, that we're part of a, you know, NIH Common Funds grant that requires us to upload this data to a deposit, uh, repository. And in order for, you know, all the scientists in the USA to get information out of this data, once you've published it, <laughs> they, you know, they need to have that factor information. So like, what, what was the purpose of the experiment? What was going on with these? And so they can start to compare apples to apples. Um, and just wanted to go um, further with that and just mention what that's all about. Um, I'll show you the website in just a minute for how we do that data upload. Um, but I just wanted to mention that, um, you know, participation in this program is not only required for us, but it also enhances our ability to be refunded. So as we uh, go ahead and, and continue to use this program, um, you know, we can hopefully get more grants and keep the cost of metabolomic services to you guys down a little bit. So uh, this is what that website looks like. Um, and another thing that is sort of interesting about this website is there are tools, and I can't see it from here, um, up, there's a tool section up here where you can actually upload some of your own data as well and use some of the statistical tools that are there um, to sort of in interpret your data. Um, another thing I want to draw your attention to is there is a section up here that says um, compounds. <laughs> I should probably put my glasses on and I could read it. Um, standards, I'm sorry, standards right here. So um, the standards section is a place where you can go through and um, if you're in the middle of a metabolomic study where you're starting to get really interested in a particular biomarker that you think is interesting and you need to have an authentic standard of that biomarker, um, you can come here and request that that gets made if it's not commercially available. In other words, you know, you can't find it at Sigma or anywhere. Um, one of the mandates of this grant was to, uh, they enlisted the uh, services of a couple of synthetic cores to create new standards for the metabolomics community. So um, you can certainly start looking at that or, you know, you can look at the standards that are there if there's something that you want to use. And I mean, I believe you can get that in you know, large quantities, so you could, um, and the purity level is listed, it's been synthesized by, you know, um, by a, uh, by a lab that, you know, is able to assess purity, et cetera, so, you know, um, you'd be able to use that, those compounds in your research as well, if it's something that you're interested in. Um, you can always talk to one of us and we can, uh, you know, you know, help you get started with that. I mean, I, I believe the form is just here, right on the website. Um, I think as of right now, they are at the point of, maybe they have about 80 requests for compounds and they've managed to synthesize about 30 of them. There are a few that are on hold because they don't really know the path of, of creating those. And then there's a few that are um, in process right now. So they're in the process of validating those, so. Um, so I think that's all I had to talk about today with regards to getting started with the core and you know the difference between our types of assays and um, how we do method development. And I will take questions. Are there any questions right now? Um, yes, go ahead. Um, well, I think the important thing there would be to do a pilot study. Have you submitted data with us? Yeah. Okay. Um, and I think, um, you know, that's going to tell you what you need to know as far as the timing, I hope, um, in terms of the, 
uh, you know, what's the best time point to start collecting data at, and then um, I think, uh, I'm sorry, the, re the other happy question was, what is the logical point at which to go forward, or? Uh huh. Okay. Well, um, I, I think it, uh, what what I would like to say is that in some cases the best thing is to talk to analysts. But I think um, you know if if there's an, an issue and you still have some questions about your data interpretation, then it's probably good to contact myself or Chuck, and then we go forward from there. Um, I know the flexomics experiments. The interpretation is a little tricky because. Um, you know, obviously the experimental design, what, what goes in up front is really important, and especially consistency between, um, you know, do, the first time you've done it and the second time you've done it. So I would say if you don't mind, just talk to us, and we'll um, kind of talk about how to go forward from there. So, okay, go ahead. I actually have a question, basic question about the definition of flexomics, so I want to uh, make sure I understand it. Uh -huh. So is it basically that you are looking at the given intermediates in a pathway to get an idea of the flux to that pathway, and that can be done with or without tracer? Is that correct? Um, I think, generally speaking, it's, ref it's the terminology is referring to tracer studies where we're definitely adding like a 13C labeled glucose or acetate or, um, you know, fatty acid to see where that labeled uh, compound is going. Um, at, you know, in terms of the, the measurement absolute quantities of any given compound in that pathway, um, that's, you know, that's just what we do all the time, but I don't, I wouldn't call it fluxomics necessarily. I guess yeah. I, I Maybe I'm just getting confused because it seems like I've seen that term used but not necessarily paired with a tracer. So maybe I'm just getting confused about what I'm seeing and maybe there um, was a tracer in there and I didn't know. Not necessarily. I mean, I, I, it, it could be used differently in the literature. Um, so I think generally it's, it's actually used with tracer. I mean, you know, uh, you could potentially do it with just a, you know, some people have done like lipid flux, you know, using a non-metabolizable analog or vitamin A to look at flux of, into one compartment or another. But in general, I think it's, it's mostly just using uh, tracer. Because uh, the example I showed you earlier with the, you know, with the cells, I mean, if you don't have a tracer, you won't actually know where things are coming from. I, I got to take one more question. I think I'm being asked to move along. Yes. You, you mentioned about high sensitivity. Mm -hmm. So what is low level the core can afford for quantification? Uh, it's different for each assay. Um, and that it's different for every compound. Just the low, lowest level. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, that's a good question. Um, I mean, I think, you know, uh, in some assays we're, you know, reporting like picogram amounts, but picogram? yeah, yeah. Um, others are, you know, nanogram. Um, it really just, it, it's very different for each compound. Keep that in mind because the ability to detect those is instrumentally based, so. Thanks. So, okay. uh, I have one more question. Can I ask? Yeah. Oh yes. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. So I have two questions for the targeted acid. So, how many uh, metabolites can you simultaneously quantify? And the second question is, how do you validate uh, the quantification is accurate? Okay. Well, I have another whole talk about the quality control and how we do the validation of the quantitation. Um, so I'll hit that again tomorrow, I believe. And in terms of the number, uh, we can simultaneously. Um, that I'm actually going to talk about tomorrow, too, because we started the, the core with the idea of doing, you know, these targeted assays, which report just, you know, for example, um, you know, one pathway or a couple pathways. But we've expanded that recently and added, um, you know, everything we can, we can see in those samples. So we're really going to be able to report you, to you if you're doing a glycolysis TCA uh, analysis, you know, most of the amino acids, because those are extracted right along with the glycolysis and TCA um, intermediates. So we should be able to report, and um, you know, quite a few more. In, uh, so I'll show you some data tomorrow, basically. So, and that's not even the complete list, but we're we're still adding compounds as we go. Yeah, thanks.